Thanks, Darren. Um, just want to thank everyone for coming here today and, and giving me 35 of your time. Start the watch now. Um, this is um, a really important thing for me to do because I, I love sport. Um, I've been involved with it as an athlete and as a volunteer administrator and as a, as a professional around um, the commercialisation of sport all my life. So anything I can do to help any sport, whether it's in a professional or, or a volunteer matter, I'll do. And um, if you know anything about our company, and I hope you learn more about us, you'll see that um, fellow team members at M5 uh, have exactly the same attitude to sport. Um, so you know who we are. M5 was created um, 10 years ago, 2009. Um, by Philip Stoneman, who was ex-commercial um, head of IMG, which at the time was the largest sports management company in the world, um, and joined later by myself and Christine Coach, two other ex-IMG executives. Um, we've all done different things in our professional careers, but the one thing that unites us is, uh, um, is a deep knowledge of the commercialization of sport and a way to do that differently to what other companies we um, how they behave and we wanted to do something that was ethically based the well-being of our clients before that of anything else the well-being of athletes the well-being of administrators and the well-being of sports themselves that uh, and it sounds corny but that is the foundation of our business and why we're together as friends and friends. Um, we think different side our own expertise that offers a care the people that we represent. Mental health is important for us, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. But core areas of business, and then there are supporting things on top of that. Talent management, so that's athlete management. Consulting services for sports federations, events rights, rights holders and government agencies, which is more in my line of business. Athlete and industry education, sports path. Sports path is an online tool for emerging athletes through to elite athletes that allows them to learn about the business of sport, their own personal career development, um, some ethics and other matters, all online, um, and provide something to people who can't attend formal education because of their training and other parts of their careers in a way that enables them to take what they can when they can. Athlete and industry education, I've just mentioned, M5 Academies for High Performance Athletes. We have established a, a triathlon academy now for both emerging and elite athletes at different levels and we're looking at maybe some other sports to bring into that. Um, athlete career development, um, we also do sport events and tourism consulting, um, we do a lot more stuff on personal development and other areas that come around the business of sport. Um, for sports administrators it's mainly about consulting on how you structure your commercial activities but so you know I've also have some expertise in governance in both federated sports but also in public companies and private companies as well. I'm the CEO of a public listed company um, in one of my professional lives um, and I can bring that expertise to bear to governance models and, and federated sports models where I've had a lifetime of um, administration as well as a volunteer. Um, our sports industry relationships are quite broad and that's about all I'll talk about us till we get right to the end. I want to talk about before we start anything, if you're going to administer a sport, if you're going to assist people, if you're going to grow a sport, you need to be sure of yourself and confident that you can move forward. And this might sound trendy, but it's not just are you okay, it's are we okay. You can't be a good sports administrator if you're not okay yourself. Mental health's not discriminatory. What are you doing within your sport to identify this, not just in your athletes, not just in your coaches, not just in your referees, but in your administrative team. Have you got a good sound basis for your team where everyone can contribute well without, despite the stresses that we're all under in, uh, in areas where there is a shortage of cash? We know that. And operating businesses in a shortage of cash environment is one of the most stressful activities you can ever do. You add on to that the unreal expectations of sports participants and parents and government administrators laying on you a burden of activity um, that you might not have the financial wherewithal to bear. And as administrators, you have enormous pressure. So be aware of that 
and, and talk to each other about how those pressures affect you from day to day. Um, your partners and sponsors are looking for the same questions of themselves and they should be asking that in their business and they expect the people they partner with to be looking after themselves. I ask it all the time about myself and the team I work with. Um, you need to lead by example. When members see leaders take ownership and charge of their own mental health, this is important, show other people in your sport that you care about yourself and your immediate team and it'll start to filter down through your sport. Businesses build mental health programs, so should sports. And then ask yourself, are you OK? Are we OK? And then we can move on and become good, sound managers of sport. Sponsorship update in Australia at the moment, and it's a massively changing world. It's fragmenting. The Australian media landscape is fragmenting. The sponsorship landscape is fragmenting. Past givens that, we, you, know, that you have come to expect that um, broadcasters such as Foxtel would pay to have small sports and niche sports um, viewed upon their platforms as a way of bringing subscribers in are no longer givens. Foxtel lost $417 million in its last financial year. Most of that was through the above the commercial um, return that they're paying for sports rights, for broadcast rights. And they know that, and they're now backing away from deals. They've tried to walk away from an FFA deal. They're looking at everything they do to pay. And that will filter down because as Fox Sports and Foxtel move out of paying money for things, other broadcast platforms, be they free-to-air, pay TV, um, internet-based platforms, streaming-based platforms, they all will trickle down and there'll be less money out of broadcast, which means you have to find money somewhere else for your sports. Um, screen league campaigns uh, are a way of developing content for these people that can give them a better commercial return. And it's a whole subject in itself. Influencers and paid social media. You know, it, so Christian Ronaldo now has 100 and, no, 224 Instagram followers, more than the Kardashian sisters combined. Um, Influencers in social media are a capability to provide money into sport. How do you do it as a sport when it's really an athlete that's getting the money? I don't know, but how do you feed off that? And it's their questions you, you can ask yourself. I don't think in this room that we have the answers to that, but the more we talk about it, someone will come up with an answer and then we can follow them. A rapidly changing global um, landscape, not just the Australian landscape, and it's the dominance of digital media. And that's the one we all need to get our heads around. How do we, how do we in, a, in a state sporting organisation, how do we get access into the money that is involved now in digital media platforms? Um, we can look at what the big sports are doing, but then you have to say, inside our organisation, do we have a capability to do this? If we do, then we go forward and do something. If we don't have a capability, then don't waste time on it. You, know, you have to make some pretty hard-headed business decisions, which are, do I have the time to learn about this and create something, and do I have the political support inside my sport to carry this forward or not? They're all questions that need to be asked and answered before you can move ahead. Increased popularity and investment in esports, and I'll get to esports a bit later on. Esports is the fastest growing sports category in the world, and I don't think there are many people in this room who would understand how big that is. When I give you some numbers later on, you will see just how big and how fast this is growing. I spoke about it, was it September? December? When February. February. That's how quick things are moving. In February, I spoke about esports and said it was fast growing and it was worth X amount of money. That's just been blown out of the water by things four months later. Increased focus on Equality, gender and cultural diversity. This is massive. It, it's not so much a monetization thing as a public relations game, but that trickles down across what you need to do. Um, it's ethically sound, and I mean that. Every sport, every sport needs to have it as a foundation because everything that's written now about sport, online and offline, is now based around its appeal on sexual equality, um, on sexual equality and on cultural diversity. And, and these are massive touch points now.
every person that writes about sport and when people write about sport they talk about sport when they talk about sport it affects the monetization of sport which is what you need to have to get the funds to run your sport better of course and if you don't have it the government won't give you any money um, Australia Australian ad spend to reach 17.2 billion in 2019 of that ad spend a large proportion is on sponsorship advertising and sponsorship in Australia is the eighth largest market in the world. Now that's enormous for us as, as maybe the 50th largest country. We are well up in the top 10 in both ad spend and sponsorship. Sponsorship in Australia forms the largest proportion of marketing spend of any country in the world. Sports sponsorship in Australia is the largest proportion of any other country in the world. Um, Value at 774 million AUD for sponsorship in Australia. If you add New Zealand in, it's over a billion dollars. I think it's 880 US dollars, um, current value of sports sponsorship in those two countries. Of those, rugby union is number two because New Zealand inflates it. Um, but AFL is the biggest, 136 million a year combined sponsorships amongst competitions and clubs. Um, I think. Then it goes rugby, then it goes NRL uh, and, and rugby league and associated levels of rugby league before it trickles down across cricket and, um, and some other sports, football, netball, I'm trying to think of them in their, in their order. But the big ones do surprise you that rugby union would be so high. And rugby union is high because of the way it's structured, it's free to wear capability, etc. But um, it's, it's high because of the demographic of the people who will pay to watch it um, and it's just a, a fact of life and it's a little thing where if you don't know your own demographic you can't monetize it um, to, to take a, a beyond um, a beyond parity for participation take it into some other levels of monetization to make your sport wealthier and better um, sponsorship generates the largest revenue in comparison to broadcast rights ticket rights and merchandise um, it's unique with Australia that sponsorship is the largest share of revenue in Australian sport. Um, more people will watch sport, talk about sport, take part in it rather than attend it in Australia than any other country in the world. Uh, the largest industry categories in Australia, and these have stayed steady for decades. They, they, other than the removal of tobacco and the growth of gaming, um, this has been the same since the 90s. Financial services, um, you know, banking and insurance is always, always one of the biggest. Motor vehicles, always one of the biggest. Um, of course, that gets skewed by um, Avesco and the, and the other motorsport industry categories in Australia, but, you know, it's, it's a huge participant across all sports. Alcohol, I'll come back to, the government, um, and that government figure will stay steady but how it's applied will change. And you've all seen in the last four years the struggle between the Australian Sports Commission and Sport Australia and the AAC about funding. And should funding, should funding be based upon participation, diversity and equality, um, which is the Sport Australia model, or should it be based upon medals at the Olympics, which is the AAC model? And the government, and governments at all levels now in Australia, have gone towards participation, equality and diversity as opposed to medals, so that um, performance is not the, um, it's not the Everest of sport anymore, it's participation if you're going to get government funding in Australia. Soft drinks, still high, and telecommunications and telcos. Um, this will be interesting as the NBN rolls out as digital platforms change and how do we define a telecommunications participant now? It's, it, the definition of the category is going to change so much in the next five years that if I was doing this talk in five years' time, I suspect that that would have to be changed into about four different categories because the players inside it are changing so quickly. Um, alcohol. Alcohol at 7.4% of the, of the sponsorship spend in Australia. Um, Russia and France have already banned um, alcohol sponsorship. Australia has the number one we're the number one country in the world on reliance on alcohol sponsorship as a percentage of our sponsorship income. Um, and you have to think to yourself, that will end. That will end at some stage. 
The same way that tobacco was removed, alcohol will be forced to pull itself away from overt sponsorship and things will go back to porridge rights and covert sponsorship. So how do you monetize alcohol um, in the future when you can't brand it is going to be something we have to consider. Um, gaming is not up there. Gaming is growing and changing every day because the laws around gaming and the removal of gaming from free-to-air TV as a sponsorship advertiser, however allowed to be on pay TV, um, and the hypocrisy around that will change. So how do, you, how do you keep aware of what might change with gaming sponsorships and gaming participation and the ethics around gaming and, and what's being told now, and even look at the papers now when they talk about Crown Casinos. If, there are all things you should be aware of or engage with people who are aware of it um, so they can help guide your thought patterns on, on monetizing your sport. Market developments, sports betting companies I've just spoken about, anti-gambling sponsorship policies are starting to come into clubs. However, they're, um, they're a little bit opaque and they tend to be motherhood statements while they still take covert sponsorships behind the scenes. Um, women's sport, women's sport, the growth of women's sport, I would say, again, in the last three to four years, this has been a massive change that um, the press coverage and then the digital coverage of women's sport um, has just massively grown. Uh, I look at, if you look at the column inches and the, the digital presentations across um, the FIFA Women's World Cup, Women's Cricket World Cup, um, you know, the Netball World Cup. Now, I could say four years ago, the Netball World Cup would have been a bigger event for Australian sports consumers as readers of sport than the Women's Cricket World Cup or um, the, the FIFA Women's World Cup. But I'll tell you now that Elise Perry and Meg Lanning and Sam Kerr, etc., are now um, bigger sports names for men and for many women than members of the Diamonds because they're getting set up on a much bigger international stage. Um, and this trend will grow with other sports. Um, alcohol sponsorship I've mentioned. Sports are looking for alternate revenue streams in addition to Sports Australia funding. Uh, community values and engagement. I, I touched on this before with the way that an emphasis upon public funding into sport is moving towards participation, diversity and equality. And, and I keep harping on those three words. I think they're becoming important mantras for anyone that's involved in the administration of sport. Core sponsorship is still strong. We have one of the greatest um, philanthropic um, uh, participation rates in the world. And a lot of this is, is miscounted as sports sponsorship disguised as philanthropy. Um, Westpac with Surf Life Saving, Rural Aid, Cricket Australia, Boost Mobile with World Surf League, which supports equal pay for, for women. Um, BHP, Royal Flying Doctor Service, CUB with Salesforce, signing with Mardi Gras in support of the LGB, LGB, LGBTQI communities. Um, all of this cause-related activity, much of that is involved in sport and gets miscounted um, as sports activity when its underlying nature is cause relation. So be aware of that and how you as, a, as an administrator in a sport can look at what you do as, is it just a sport or is there a cause behind the sport that will allow you to grab someone else's attention and boost yourself above someone else who's competing for the same dollars? And these are all thoughts you have to have. This is all part of being prepared to take your sport forward. Developing a successful sponsorship program. Developing a successful sponsorship program. This is what we can assist you to do when I talk about we. It's M5 and, and my team members. Um, and there are questions you need to have. Questions such as, are you sourcing revenue from all your available corporate avenues? And I would lay London to a brick that nobody administering any sport, and whether that's um, you know, Gillan McLaughlin at the AFL, right down to anyone who is you know, looking at a, a local club, ever, ever fully minds all the activities they've got to get all the money they can get. Sometimes because it's just too hard and it's not worth the effort, sometimes because you don't know enough. But there is expertise out there and there is time out there and you just have to make your business decisions on how best to use those times and that expertise and is it worth it? 
Are you actively seeking new best fit sponsors using market leading materials? All right. And that, that question is really important. When we talk in terms of sales management, we often talk in terms of two different types of people, hunters and farmers. Hunters go out and get new sponsors. Farmers make sure you retain your sponsors. It's always easier to retain a sponsor and grow a sponsor. But hunting looks at not just getting new sponsors, but new sponsorship from the same sponsor too, to grow their, grow their relationship with you. So don't just look at this is what we do. Always look at this is what we do, this is what we can do, and this is how we grow. Because as sure as you know, my shoes are now touching the carpet, as sure as that, you will lose sponsorships and sponsorships will diminish over time. So you always have to replace and grow the sponsorships you've got and be looking forward and doing some hunting as well as some farming. Do your sports have a clear plan on how to increase sponsorship revenue year on year? It's the same thing. Have a plan. Don't just think we've got to do it. Write it down and plan for it. And it doesn't need to be complicated. In fact, complicated plans are the worst plans because they take up so many pages no one will read them and they're too hard to implement. When you create a plan, it's got to be implementable and it's got to be simple, but it has to have a clear structure that allows you to do it nearly without thinking. Are you servicing and renewing sponsors professionally and cost effectively? That's what I said. You can spend as much time as you like you know, making the most important plans with every little detail covered, but if that takes too much time, then it's not worth your time, it's not worth your effort, it's not worth your money. So you have to make these constant decisions, balancing how much, how efficient do I want to be, how inefficient can I be without wasting money. These are all the trade-offs you have in, in a world of scarce resources, which is sports administration. Do you know what you own? The first thing we always say to a sport, and it's the first thing I'd say to any business, is take stock of what you have yourself. You can't sell something if you don't know you have the right to sell it. The next thing is you should never sell something that you don't have the right to sell because that's the surest way to lose a sponsor for life. Um, take an audit of what you have. Sports auditing is the first step we always make with anyone. Provide a baseline for you that has full visibility. You can lay it down in a simple to read matrix that says this is what I have. This is what I think it's worth and then you're right next to that, as you sell sponsorships aligned to that um, asset, this is what the market now thinks it's worth, and then you keep assessing that. And you'll get then a baseline of information that you can just grow day after day, month after month, year after year. Enables optimal packaging of assets and the creating of additional packages and revenue. What M5 can help you with? All companies like M5. You know, we're not the only one. We think we're, we have the best fit for, um, for sports, particularly tiers two and three sports, and three and four, sorry, where we have a particular affinity um, for them. A clearly defined sponsorship structure with current and potential inventory. Current versus projected revenues. Action plan with sponsorship priorities and tasks. Sponsorship servicing strategy. Strategies for memberships, engagement, and further capture of participation numbers. This slide, if you do nothing else out of this morning, when this is emailed out to you, you throw the rest of the presentation away and just hold on to that slide because that forms the, base, the basis of your plan to monetize your sport in your state with your administration team. That's, that sums it up perfectly. Market ready proposals. Something that is that when you present it to a potential sponsor, it's easy for them to understand what they're going to get and it shows them clearly what's in it for me. What's in it for me? Recommendations regarding new business initiatives. So we, you need to know how are you going to capture new business and, and then follow those recommendations. And then consultancy support because there's no point just delivering someone a report without following up to see how that report's being acted upon. Otherwise, you've paid money for nothing. Um, if the person who gives you a report doesn't commit to follow up with you, then they're giving you nothing. They're giving you nothing other than they're receiving a check without the care to find out have what they've given you, is it implementable? Because you, until you start doing it, you won't know. If it's not implementable, how do we change it and adjust it to make sure that you can move forward with it? And how has your sport changed? Your, your sports administration, your group might have changed. I've got five minutes left, which allows some time for questions. Um, but I do want to go back to esports and how big they are. For those people who don't know, who's heard of Fortnite? 
Who knew there was a Fortnite World Cup finalised over the weekend? Who knows how much the first prize winner got? $3 million US. More money, more money than Tiger Woods got for winning the Masters. More money than Tiger Woods got for winning the Masters. The pairs team that won the doubles won $3 million US split between them. The overall prize pool was $30 million, which was as much as the total prize pool for the just completed FIFA Women's World Cup. Yet that fortnight competition is not the number one esports competition in the world. Data Sports, or Data 2, sorry, has the number one competition with even more prize money. Um, there are teams now, I'll, I'll give you an idea, the 50 people who made the finals of that Fortnite World Cup were guaranteed a minimum US 50,000 each. A minimum US 50,000 each. There's a 13 year old kid who won 900 grand US last weekend um, for being the fifth place competitor. I've sa I sat on a train the other day and I heard three young kids talking to themselves about where we're going to practice. They've created their own team for an esports team to go on the data competition next year. Um, and they're estimating that if they do it right, they could share about 180 grand each between them. Now, this, is, this is what kids are getting into and, and we need to be aware of it. And so the A-League, FFA, have got, not just got an A-League now, they've got an E-League. And other sports should be looking at how can you get involved with this. And that's all I'm going to say. Questions? The differentiation between sort of not profit sort of opportunities as opposed to some of those sports that have an APEC an APEC commercial um, sort of arm. Um, is there sort of differentiation between that that you guys might see or first first rule is everything's for profit. Mm. Everything's for profit. If you don't make a profit, you can't do any good in the world. Um, your sport needs to be at least revenue neutral, at least revenue neutral. Otherwise, it'll die um, because it costs money to administer a sport. If you start losing revenue in one area and you start charging more fees, your participation will lose. And you'll have to establish at some stage a price elasticity of membership fees. I mean, there are economic forces that drive that. However, there are activities that every person does in their sport that can be reflected back on a benefit to the community and community engagement. And one of the biggest ones is just getting people um, out, of, out of delinquency and onto a sporting field. Um, and, and there are numerous studies that show that. Just go and research, you know, do some research about how your sports are helping different communities, how people who participate in your sport also do community work. Um, it doesn't have to be a registered charity. It, it just has to be anything that helps the community. What you're trying to do is just get a story to tell someone that makes a difference between them giving you, you know, a pot of cash and them saying, look, it's a nice story, but I don't see how I, you know, I can't justify that above just spending money on TV advertising. So it takes it from being marketing to something that has passion and passion's the key to sport. Passion is the key to money in sport. People will give you money because of their passion. Another question? Um, oh, we did North Bondi Surf Club, but I can tell you about my own surf club, North Cronulla, where we had to translate from our biggest sponsor um, up until the past few years was Carlton United Breweries. Um, and due to changes in place, some to do with our council, some to do with um, sale of hotel management rights in our area, um, they trickled down now to being only about our fifth biggest sponsor, purely linked to Porridge. Um, to replace that, we had to engage with other venues in the community and other participants, um, some within ex-members of our club, to bring them up in other categories. And they include manufacturing, um, hospitality, and banking and finance through insurance. And the, the banking and finance one is, is a foundation grant um, where we established a foundation and then got a whole network of um, local insurance agents to contribute to a charitable foundation to provide scholarships to our members. So I, 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 the agreements are confidential, I can't give you the monetary value, but I can say now that we make more money out of that by diversifying um, our sponsorship base and engaging more broadly than we made out of our single pot focus with Carlton United Breweries. Anyone else?
Time for one, yeah. Well, the change, the change in focus will be to remove it from um, signage opportunities and advertising to brand loyalty and porridge. Um, so if you, know, if you know breweries, you know that, um, and it's a terrible thing, but if they, if, they, if they get the drinker between the ages of 16 and 19, they'll hold them for most of their life. Um, uh, drinkers might change um, the type of beer within a, a a brand suite, but they usually stick within the brand suite. Um, there's, there's research that supports that. So they, they like um, sports that have teenage participants um, because they build brand loyalty amongst them. Yeah, but increasingly then they have to diversify away. Won't accept that, yeah. Because it won't be called sponsorship and it won't be called marketing, it'll be called porridge rights. Porridge rights means that you give the exclusive rights for someone to deliver packaged or on tap beer or spirits or any other consumable into your club and by giving them um, exclusive rights, you give them de facto endorsement. Now you can call it a sponsorship, you can call it marketing, you can call it porridge rights. It's cash in the door for a club and how you redefine that to get around the laws is is something where you need to be a bit flexible. The ethics of that is up to you. Good sports also say that they like to have, if there's going to be drinking around a sport, they prefer that the adults and the kids be in together because having the children there modifies the behaviour of the adults um, and, and provides a better venue for the sport and a more responsible venue. Um, I, should, I, I do the good sports program. You know, I was one of the, we're one of the first clubs to become a gold, or gold silver, bronze good sports participant. Um, I'm also a member of protection officer through the Australian Sports Commission program. So I, I know that space. Um, I also am aware that you need cash. So how do you do all those things responsibly? I'm less inclined to be pro-gaming, but we have sponsors in lots of clubs around the place who don't promote gaming, but promote venues that have gaming. And, and they can be from you know, mega licensed clubs that own several other clubs underneath them through to um, you know, just the local pub that has five poker machines. I mean, it's, there's never anything black and white in, in anything to do with life. And that includes sponsorship and it includes the ethics of gaming, alcohol, tobacco, you know, the junk food, soft drink. You know, when does handing out 10 McDonald's vouchers from the local McDonald's to the best and fairest player each week, when does that become promoting an addiction to junk food? They're all ethical decisions we make every day. You need cash to survive, you need cash to provide sporting facilities. Who are you going to take it from? I, I can't give you those answers. I can tell you how to make the money. I have my own particular ethics, which are surprisingly quite conservative um, and would steer away from a lot of things personally. But if that bankrupts your sport, who are you helping? And, and these are decisions you have to make. You know? And you get judged on other things. As a sports administrator, um, you're being judged on what's the money you're bringing into your sport, how you're growing your membership base, how you're providing facilities, juggling that on diminishing budgets. And, and with a very tight administration, like you don't have the number of, you never have the number of employees you need to do the work that's expected of you. You'll never have it. I've been on both sides of the fence, and I know that for a fact. And, and I sympathise with you, but you, you have to make these calls every day. And you don't have the comfort of making black and white decisions. You will always have to live in the grey because of the compromises that surround everything in life. 